Thank you, gentlemen. Great job. What a blessing it is to grow up in a Christian home. I know many of you would uh, join me in saying that you had that blessing. Parents who were devoted to Christ and involved in what God is doing through the church. It's good to know that the Lord Jesus Christ can still reach out and find those who don't have that blessing. But it's a great blessing. But I have noticed over the years, as I've worked with families, that there is an unusual challenge that is faced by those who grow up in a Christian family. Many times in a Christian family, children are saved at a young age, and before they really understand what they're going to face in the world as adults. And when they finally reach that point where they begin to make their own choices, their own decisions, and chart their own course in life, they hit a transition period that for some of us was more difficult than for others. For some of us, it took longer than for others. Some people seem to sail through and do just fine. But almost everyone has some point where they have to make a transition. A transition from worshiping the God of mom and dad to worshiping the God of me. And that can be a tough, tough transition. We come to a man this morning who is struggling through that transition. He's reached a crisis point in his life where he has to decide. His name is Isaac. Would you join me in Genesis chapter 26, starting at the beginning of the chapter? Get your bulletin out if you would. Turn it over. Let's take a couple of notes as we go along. From my Father's God to my God. Genesis chapter 26, starting in verse 1. The NIV puts it this way. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. When Abram was called by God to follow him, he was given a great challenge. God told him to leave behind everything he had known, his family, his culture, his business, his city, and to move hundreds of miles and to live the rest of his life as a stranger in a strange land based on God's promise, to choose God's promise over the security of the things that he had known. Abraham was a man of faith, and so he was willing to do that. Now, you would think that after making a big move like that, that things would go well, at least for a while, but they didn't. Right after God, uh, Abraham made that big move of faith, there was a famine in the land. And surely Abraham wondered why, after obeying God, God would allow something like that to happen. And here we see his son, Abraham's son, Isaac, is facing another famine. And this was pretty serious back then for the way that they lived. When there was a famine, uh, it meant that uh, they may die. It meant that they may lose everything. A famine for them was like a crash uh, on Wall Street for us. It, it could wipe everyone out. And so this is a serious event that's happening in the life of Isaac. And it reflects a similar event that happened in his dad's life. Verse 2, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Now, the first thing that catches my eye in this verse is the fact that the Lord appeared to Isaac. And I'm curious. I can't help it. I want to know, what did he see? How did the Lord appear to Isaac? And I'm frustrated because we don't, we don't get any answer to that question. Uh, the text doesn't tell us anything about what Isaac saw. There are other places in the Bible where we are told uh, where we're given visual information about what people saw. John, when he got his uh, revelation in the apocalypse. Ezekiel, when he was by the river, uh, and so forth. But not today. Today, what matters most is what the Lord said, his word. We're meant to focus in on that. And notice he starts out with a do not. Do not go down to Egypt. Now, this was a tough start for Isaac. Because in his day, in his time, if there was a famine, the very first thing that you would do is what? Go down to Egypt. That's what his dad did. That's what Abraham did. Now, for Abraham, it ended up being a disaster in Egypt. Nevertheless, that's still what common knowledge would say, common practice. Everyone would go to Egypt. There's plenty of water there in Egypt. We've got to leave, this, leave our home behind. 
until the rains come again, and we've got to go and we've got to find help in Egypt. It's the natural thing to do. And God tells him, don't do that. Stay where I tell you to stay. Verse 3, stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. Now, there's, those are ands, but the implication is that there's a logical connection. In other words, God is saying, stay in this land for a while so that I can bless you. If you don't stay in this land, then I can't promise my blessing to you. If you do, then I will be with you. I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, back to verse 3, I will give these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. At that very moment, Isaac may have looked around and said, I don't know if I want this land. It's a land prone to famine. What good is it? Does it really have much value? God seems to think so, because he's promising to give it to him. The NIV says, stay in this land for a while. All of that big, long phrase is one word in Hebrew, gur, and it means to sojourn. God is constantly calling his people, us included, to be sojourners in this land, in this life. To see that this is not our permanent home. This is a temporary setting for us. We're on our way to somewhere else. Now there's something we need to accomplish while we're here, but this isn't it. There's more to it than this. And he wanted to make sure that Isaac understood that. Isaac is facing two alternatives. The way of the world, which says go down to Egypt and get water, and the way of God that says, I want you to risk staying where you are and trust me. I want you to hear this promise, I will be with you. I want you to desire me, God, more than the things of this world. Here's the first thing on our outline this morning. The first question that occurs to me in looking at this text is, why did God want Isaac and a family? Where is all the health and wealth gospel? Where is all that success preaching? God wants you to have plenty of water. God wants you to have plenty of crops. God wants you to have plenty of health. God wants you to have plenty of success. Instead, we have a God here who's saying, no, I want you to stay in a land of famine. I want you to stay in a land where it's going to be difficult, where you're going to have to work to survive, where you're going to wonder, why am I here? Why did I not just go down to Egypt where everything is easier? We need to ask ourselves when we listen to people teach the Bible, listen to people preach God's Word, when they make certain promises, it's up to us. We have a responsibility to look back to God's Word and ask ourselves, are they being true to God's Word? Are they really presenting the God of the Bible? Are they just tickling my itching ears? Are they just telling me what I want to hear? There's a lot of people around telling us what we want to hear. They have big crowds, but that's fine. Jesus said that the way to disaster is a wide road and there's a lot of people on it. And the way to life it's a, it's a tough road. It's, it's a narrow road. It's a rocky road. There's not many people that want to walk on it, but those are the people who find life. And Isaac is faced with a decision here, just like we are. And we ask ourselves, though, why does God want Isaac in the land of family? Here's the answer. So Isaac would choose. God is a God of choosing. He has given us the ability to make choices. This is what's frustrating for many of us as parents. We were given the opportunity to choose. We would like to make that choice for our, our children, for our sons and daughters. We would, like to, we would like to guarantee that our sons and daughters would make the same choices that we do. Well, at least the good ones that we make. Maybe not all of them. But we can't. We can do a lot for them. But we can't make choice for them. Any more than our parents can make the choice for us. This is a God-given thing. Nobody can take it away. Nobody. We shouldn't even try. We can influence. We can encourage. We can do a lot of things, but we cannot remove this choice element that God has given. And every generation has to make the choice over and over and over again. Abraham made the choice for himself and his generation. Now Isaac is faced with that choice. Our fathers and mothers made the choice for them. Now it's our generation. It's our turn. It's our turn to be faithful in our generation. We have to make the choice. We can't run on what they did. We have to do something for ourselves. So Isaac would choose God's promises. This is what God wants us to choose, his promises. And the world would say, how can you trust God? Look, you're in a family. Well, God is promising me and 
and the rest of his people something a lot bigger than what's happening in this world. And I believe that. I choose to believe that. He, wants to, he wanted Isaac to choose God's promises over the world's promises, is the end of that sentence. So Isaac would choose God's promises over the world's promises. He had the opportunity to decide for himself. Look at the promises, though, that God makes to Isaac. Verse 3, stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you. I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give these lands, and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give them all of these lands, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Now this is a restatement of the promises that were made to Abraham the generation before that. They started way back in chapter 12. And God reiterated these promises to Abraham on several occasions, but we see the same kind of language. It's the same, but it's a little bit different. Abraham's ultimate faith, uh, uh, ultimate test of faith was on Mount Moriah. Remember that? When God said, I want you to take your son, your beloved son, the son of the promise, and I want you to take him to this mountain that I will show you in the region of Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. Abraham was willing to do that. And, of course, the angel stopped Abraham at the last instant so that he didn't actually sacrifice his son, but he proved that he was willing to do anything that God asked him to. And at that point, God reiterated the promises to Abraham. And the question I have is, did Isaac hear those promises that day? Remember, Isaac was there. He was old enough to understand what was going on. He was old enough to trust his father enough to be bound and to be put up on an altar and to realize, whoa, I'm the sacrifice today. Because he had been asking him, where's the sacrifice? And, and Abraham didn't want to answer that question. That was a hard question for him. And his answer was, the Lord will provide. He didn't realize how prophetic his utterance was because the Lord did provide a, a, a ram for the sacrifice in place of Isaac. But Isaac exercised faith that day, but his faith wasn't necessarily in God. It was in his father, in Abraham. Abraham was exercising his faith in God. This is the first time, however. These are the same promises, but they're different. Never before had God said, I will be with you. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? Do you pray in your prayer life? Do you ask for God to be with you? We understand as New Testament believers more about what that means, I think, than the Old Testament saint did because God poured out His Spirit on the church at Pentecost and we know that the way that God is with us is by filling our hearts with His very presence, His invisible, personal, powerful presence, God's Holy Spirit in our very lives. But He's making this promise to be with Isaac. And also, instead of saying this land as he had to Abraham, he says these lands. Singular has become plural. It's subtle, but it's expanding. It's getting different. And there's an emphasis in here on uh, to you. Look at verse 3. It says, stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give these lands. That's emphatic in the way that it's put together in the Hebrew language. Because God is telling him, I know I made these promises to Abraham, but now it's you. It's to you. You and your descendants. You're up. It's your turn to bat. It's your turn to stand up and be the one who is the leader and who makes the choices of faith. He mentions both Isaac's offspring, but he's also mentioning Abraham at the same time. Can you see the tension in these promises here between the future and the past? There's Isaac's descendants, and there's Abraham, the father of faith, and Isaac stands between both of them. From this point forward, that's the way it will always be. Abraham was unique because there wasn't anyone before him necessarily. He was the starting point. He is the, he's the nail that was put into the wall, and everything else is built off of that. And we, like Isaac, can both look back to our fathers and the faith that they had, and we can look forward to our descendants, and we stand in that same tension that he did. Verse 5, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. Abraham was a man of faith. He left a good example. He wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. He went to Egypt when he shouldn't have, uh, but he got back where he needed to be. And that parental obedience was a blessing on Isaac. Parents, the best thing we can do for our kids 
the best thing, the best thing that we can do for our children to try to smooth the way of faith before them is to be men and women of faith ourselves. Oh yes, we need to teach them the word. We need to tell them the stories. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand the ramifications of the decisions they're making. But more than all of that, what matters most is that we must be faithful ourselves. We can teach them all that we want. And if we're unfaithful, guess what, 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 they're, what the message is that they get? The message is that it really doesn't matter because mom and dad didn't do it. If they really thought it was important, they would have done it too. But that's the best thing that we can do for the Isaacs who come after us is to remain faithful. But back to Isaac. Sooner or later, Isaac must stand up and make his own choices. He can't blame Abraham anymore. The day comes when he is responsible. Now, it's interesting in verse 5, it says that Isaac is blessed because Abraham obeyed. It shows that there's no conflict between promise and law, which that in itself is a separate subject, which is fascinating. I'll just note it in passing and we'll move on. This isn't just for those of us who are married and have children, by the way. If you're here today and you're single, you have no children, you may be thinking, well, the preacher's not talking to me today. Wrong. We're all in this together. No matter who we are, there's still a next generation of faith. And we're all working together to make sure that there will be a strong next generation of faith. No matter who we are, whether we're single, uh, whether we have children or not, there's a, there was a generation that came before us. And they have passed down to us the faith. And we have a certain responsibility to do something with it. So we live in this tension between the past and the future called the present. This always makes me think about church music. Been a very, very contentious subject in some churches. Nowhere else, perhaps, but in, in a church, in a local church, can you see the, the tension between the past and the future than in worship music. The past stands with such incredible strength because it has been sifted over all these years. We forget sometimes that in the past, a lot of songs were written that weren't so good, but they have faded from our memory. Only the very best is left of the past. The, how many hymns have been written over the last few hundred years? If we had them all in our hymn book this morning, it would probably be almost as high as a stack of the Internal Revenue Service rules. Almost, not quite. But our, our hymnal is very short. Why is that? Because we have the very best, the best of the past, the very best hymns, the ones that have the best theology and the best music, and have joined those together. Nevertheless, they're still from the past. And young people yearn for something that's innovative. They want to spread their wings and fly. They want to do something new. Okay, mom and dad, you did something for God. Let me do something for God too. Let me do something innovative and refreshing. And so we have this new music. And it's easy for those of us who aren't so new anymore to look at the new music and say, but so much of it is so shallow. So much of it just seems like there's no theological depth to it at all. If we could just transport ourselves back to the time when those hymns were being written, we would realize that a bunch of them were there too. I, I can show you, if, you're, if you want to argue with me, I'd love to. I love to debate, especially when I know I'm going to win. <laughs> See, I love to collect old hymnals, and I've got hymnals in my office going back for decades, a hundred years. And I can show you some silly, silly hymns. I mean, just goofy. And you can look at them and you go, why did they even publish that? It's a piece of junk. Well, they were going through the same process that we're going through today. And those of us who have a few white hairs or gray hairs need to realize that the young people are going to go through the same process that we did. And they need to be allowed to go through that process. They need to be respectful of the things that their parents have done, but they also have to make their own choices. They have to take the gospel and move forward in the way that God enables them to do it. In a church, any church, somewhere in the hallway, on more than one occasion, there should be a two-year-old that runs down the hall and bumps into a 70-year-old 
in a parent who says, quit running. Because if that doesn't happen, something's wrong. If the two-year-old is not there to run down the hall, something is wrong in that church. If the 70-year-old is not there to be run into, something's wrong with that church. And if the parent is not there to say, stop running, there's something wrong with that church. All three of those generations need to be in the church together. Do we drive each other crazy sometimes? Yeah, we do. But it doesn't matter. We love each other and we belong together. The children need to run down the hall. And the seniors need to say, stop doing that. That's the way the church should be. You can't have a ship on the ocean that just has a rudder, but no sail. It's pointed in the right direction. It's got the right doctrine. It's got the right theology. It's got the right teaching. It's got all of the heritage. But it's sitting dead in the water. It's not even moving. And sometimes it doesn't even realize that it's died. It needs a sail so that the breeze will catch the sail and propel it forward. You can't have a ship in the open ocean without a rudder and a sail. It'll catch the wind and it'll move. It'll go all over the place. But nobody knows where it will end up because it has no rudder. It's directionless. It will just spin around with the currents of the world and end up nowhere. It will crash. But when you put the sail and the rudder together, then you have something. When you put together the life of the next generation and the wisdom of the generation that is passing on, then you've got something. Isaac and Abraham. Isaac and Abraham. Why did God repeat his promises? That's the next question this morning. Why did God repeat his promises? So Isaac would see their relevance for him and his generation. Our job is not just to pass the faith on in all its content, our job is also to make sure that the next generation sees how relevant the faith is to the things that they are facing. We've got to realize that each generation faces different battles. The Christian faith is unchanging. It's an ancient word that is etched in stone. And it's a stone upon which we stand that gives us a solid place for our feet. And we shouldn't try to change it. We, don't have, we have no mandate to change the message. Nevertheless, Every generation that comes along faces new challenges. It's not the same thing to be a Christian in Germany in the 1930s as it is to be a Christian uh, in Africa in the 1960s. It's not the same thing to be a Christian in France during the Revolution as it was to be a Christian in the United States uh, in the 1800s. Just pick any place and any time in history and ask yourself what was going on. And Christians were facing some unique challenges that were going on. You and I face unique challenges today. This is our turn. We, this is our chance to be faithful in our generation. And Jesus came to his generation and he said, you can read what's going on in the sky. You know when it's going to rain. You know when it's going to be hot. But you can't read what God's doing and you're going to miss it. The best thing we can do for our children is for them to see us understand what God is doing and to react properly to it so that when they get their turn, they will do the same thing. They will say, you know what? My mom and dad face certain things as Christians and their generation face certain things and they have the discernment and the courage to face those things. And the world has changed. It's not exactly the same now as it was for mom and dad, but we have challenges too. And we've got to discern those challenges and we've got to have the courage to face those challenges as well. Why did God repeat his promises? Well, his promises are repeated to every generation. But if you, if you listen very carefully, you'll see that they're just a little bit different. The content hasn't changed, but there's something a little different in each generation that makes it relevant to that generation. And that was true of Isaac. So what will he do? Verse 6. Very simple. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now think about this for a minute. This illustrates exactly what I've been talking about. When God came and he spoke to Abraham, for Abraham to be faithful in his generation to God, he had to go. He had to go. He had to leave his home where he had grown up and go to a place where he would be a stranger. Now, for Isaac to be faithful in his generation, what does he have to do? Stay. Stay. Same promises. Same God. Different application. Isaac had to understand what it meant for him to be faithful in his generation. 
It wasn't exactly the same thing as Abraham. Isaac could have said, you know, my dad was faithful by leaving behind his culture, his family, and everything, and going hundreds of miles and living in a new place. So I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. And he would have been absolutely wrong. He would have been completely outside of the will of God. Because he couldn't just copy what Abraham did. There were certain aspects of it he needed to get, but he couldn't copy it A to Z. He had to have his own relationship with God. He had to have his own word from God. He couldn't go to God through Abraham. He had to go to God himself. Yes, Isaac was on Mount Moriah, and he said yes to Abraham, but there had to come a time when he said yes to Yahweh. Yes to the Lord. Abraham had to move aside, and Isaac had to have a relationship directly with the Lord. That's a tough transition for some of us. Isaac now is beginning to make it. He can either complain about the famine or he can rejoice in God's promises. Why did Isaac stay in the famine? That's the last question that I get out of this text. Why did he stay? And my answer is this. He was willing to risk following God. He was willing to to risk following God. Why do I say that following God is a risk? It is. It always looks like a risk. It always looks like a risk when everyone else is going to Egypt and God says, you don't go. When everyone else is living a certain way, and God says, you don't do that. When everyone else is defining family a certain way, and God says, I know this is going to be hard, but you've got to stand uh, and say that you're different. When everyone else is doing something with their time, and with their assets and with everything that they've got. And God says, you don't live that way. You live a different way. You see your time differently. You see your money differently. You see your life differently. It seems like a risk not to follow in the pathway of the world. But it's a risk that I believe is worth taking. It was for Abraham. It was for Isaac. And we're still in Genesis. Many generations have come since Abraham and Isaac to now, and every generation that's been willing to risk following God has found that it's worth the risk. The lessons far outweigh any losses that we have, that we incur. I read this week about a, a young lady named Lauren. Lauren had a pretty good life. Things were going well for her, but she had that desire to be a movie star. And if you're going to be a movie star, you have to go where? So she went. She left behind all that was going so well in her life, and she went to Hollywood. And when Lauren got to Hollywood, things got tough. They didn't work out the way that she thought they would. She didn't just walk right onto the stage and become uh, a star as easily as she had hoped. And it got down to where it was pretty bad. And her folks back home stayed in touch with her. Of course, they were concerned about her. And she was Skyping with her dad one night, and he finally just asked her, he said, How's it going, Lauren? Because she'd been telling him, oh, everything's fine, I'm doing good, it's all going well. But there was just something about the way Dad asked the question that night. How's it going? She broke down and she told him, it's not going well at all. It's a disaster. I'm a failure. Well, Dad's answer to that was to send a check. Well, she needs money, send her money. But Mom had a different answer. Here's what Mom said to Lauren. Mom said, Lauren, would you do something with me? For the next 30 days, every day, I'll contact you and we'll pray together. For 30 days, every single day, you and I will pray together. And Lauren agreed to do that. Well, at first, it was mostly mom praying and Lauren crying. You know, Lauren had sort of forgotten who God was and, and lost all of that that had been taught to her as a little girl growing up. But as the 30 days passed, a funny thing began to happen. Lauren began to pray more and more and more. And she began to pour her heart out to God more and more. And by the end of the 30 days, Lauren had learned to pray to God the way she needed to as an adult woman. The things that she should have decided to do earlier but didn't for whatever reason. And now she had it. Now, in the article about this story, the happy ending is that Lauren gets a walk on part in some TV show. But I disagreed with the article. I didn't think that was the happy ending at all. In fact, it didn't matter whether Lauren ever made it in Hollywood or not. To me, the happy ending is that Lauren finally made a transfer from thinking of God as mom and dad's God to thinking of God as her God. And 
And God had to take her into an area of famine to do it. But he was willing. And it worked. Where are you this morning? Where are you? Would you bow your heads with me for a moment?